Welcome to the Corporate Learning Network videocast. I'm Jeff Cattell. Today I have with me Nigel Payne, a thought leader in the fields of leadership, learning, and technology. Nigel has put those skills to work in various positions, including a stint as the head of people development at the BBC in the mid-2000s. Nigel, welcome to the program. Thank you very much indeed, Jeff. It's great to talk to you. It's great to talk to you too. So I want to start by talking about this international focus, which I really think you can offer our viewers. A lot of the things we report on at CLN focus on corporate learning in a domestic sense. So are there different trends that you're seeing for corporate learning emerging on the international stage? It's a very, it's a very good question. Um, once upon a time, I could have waxed lyrical about the massive differences between the US and the rest of the world. Now it's not so sharp. The differences are much, much closer together than they used to be. There's one big US trend which hasn't manifested itself around the world yet, and that's a real renewal of interest in leadership development, but not conventional leadership development as it used to be, you know, one week face-to-face -face or sending people off to some kind of business school. Much more emphasis on online, social, networking, um, blogging kind of leadership development. That hasn't manifested itself in Europe, where the emphasis is still really on, not mobile, I'm sick of mobile, I think that's the wrong word, it's basically multi-device learning. That's the biggest, biggest push at the moment in the rest of the world. And when I say the rest of the world, I mean Europe, South America, Eastern Europe as well as Central Europe. There's this huge, huge emphasis because people want to take their learning with them. They don't want to sit, in, sit at their desk, they don't want to sit in a room, they just want to be able to take their learning from room, from desk, onto train, at home, wherever they want to be, they want to have their learning with them. And that is a massive driver for most organizations, trying to meet that incredible pressure of demand. Okay. Yeah, going off that, so you're talking about all these different different devices that people can can use to access learning, to access training, to access ways of professional development. So I know that you were sort of at the forefront of that in many of your past positions in terms of e-learning at a variety of different companies. So as you're mentioning, it now seems that the, on the world stage, really companies are taking hold of that and really realizing the potential and the need for those e-learning modules. So. What steps do you take from there once it's sort of implemented uh, at the very most basic level? It, it, it's sort of taking up from e-learning, but there's something else going on which is kind of more important, and that is uh, basically smashing up the old e-learning model. There was a great song by a group called Orange Juice where the chorus was, smash it up and start again. And in some ways, that's what we're doing with e-learning, we're smashing it up, but the concept of the isolated learner sitting in front of the machine, often just pressing the return key, absorbing great chunks of learning. That old model of e-learning, no one wants anymore. Creating massive resistance now in companies where people say, I'm just not going to do it unless you make me do it. And that's not a great way to create learning. What's much more interesting now is merging social with uh, information. Um, Creating a desktop that's full of multiple access points, you know, Dropbox, um, stuff based on web technologies, on, on um, browser-based technologies, uh, chat rooms, uh, Twitter, incorporating all of these different elements that most of us use in our day-to-day -day life. We're trying to pull those together into a learning environment. And if you like, some of the MOOCs are really pointing the way forward. I'm not a great one for saying MOOCs have changed the world. In many ways, they haven't. They're slightly going back into old times. Someone sitting in front of a, a, a camera for 20-minute chunks, just staring, staring wildly and talking to you. But some MOOCs, like I was, I was in the uh, University of Pennsylvania last week, and they've got a MOOC called Mod Po, Modern Poetry. And if you look at it, it's based um, around one of the propriety uh, software systems. But what it is is an explosion of different opportunities to learn. The actual sessions, live sessions, are done in a room. So people can turn up physically if they happen to be in Philadelphia, and they can walk in the room and they can participate. They have teaching assistants who interview some of the people online. They have synchronous chat, asynchronous chat, documents, videos, huge amount of different resources. If you look at each week block, the resource list is almost a page. And they're basically saying, what suits you, you choose. 
You want to weigh into this? You work out your own way. One where there isn't a 96% dropout rate. Vast numbers. I think the majority of people go right through to the 10th module, which is an incredible tribute to that simple message. Give people multiple ways to learn, and that's the way they want to learn. And that's true in that MOOC, and it's true right across the corporate world, whether that's in the US or whether that's in, in any other country. So there's a whole bunch of learning technologists and learning professionals trying to work out how they can break up that conventional model of e-learning and make it more dynamic, more exciting, more interactive, and above all, more social. That's a critical underlining that's going on all over the place in corporate learning. Yeah, it, it sounds like there's some really dramatic changes in terms of what you're saying, in terms of the role of a learning and development professional with all of these. It's not the same, um, uh, you know, module that you're putting out to every single person you want to offer all these options but then those people who are um, the people uh, who are organizing that really have to be um, proficient or even experts in all those things to know you know what is best in different situations so how has this shift in terms of you know having all these different learning modules versus maybe a one sort of centralized or one very specific module how has that changed the role of a learning and development professional the, the answer is Jeff completely and the learning and development professionals who are getting that, I think have got a really, really exciting career ahead of them because of all these changes. Those who don't get it and are still putting out catalogues of, of uh, courses every six months, they're in trouble because they're getting a kind of pushback from not only from the senior executives who are saying, well, why are we wasting our money on this stuff, but from the, from the users themselves who are saying, hey, there's, there must be a better way and there is a better way. I suppose there are three major changes in the role. The first is it's a role that's placed around facilitation rather than direction. And it's also a role that's placed on perhaps sometimes consulting rather than directly doing. So you're enabling different parts of the organization to get their act together. You're supporting different groups to get things organized. You're encouraging the whole organization to maybe contribute content and you're acting more as a curator of content rather than a developer of content. You're maybe acting as the smart guide to help people through the network of MOOCs, a network of um, open resources which are out there. You know, if you're a company, why create something that is freely available somewhere else? The key is to know that that's the one to go for rather than all these others. So that curatorial, expert, intermediate role is starting to emerge. And it's a really interesting and successful role. So you're kind of serving your group, you're helping them help themselves to learning rather than doing it for them. And that, that sense of responsibility is more and more important. You've got to get, in some ways, a whole organization behind learning, not just the learning team. And when you've got that, you get something quite exciting, quite dynamic, and, and really investing in change. If you're just expecting a small team to do it all for you, it's always going to be disappointing and it's always going to be slow. Yeah, it does make sense having this organizational focus on things rather than, you know, a, a siloed group that you're, that you're alluding to. Yeah, so another thing I want to talk about that I feel like we haven't necessarily touched up on explicitly is another one of your areas of focus being organizational development, which is often housed at least under HR or learning and development as well. So I know that, you know, in the worldwide recession that sort of, you know, spun out of control starting in 08 and 2009, we saw companies that were sort of lessening their focus on organizational development, especially from a monetary standpoint, um, and maybe just saying we have bigger fish to fry at this point, we have bigger things to focus on, we don't have the time to look at those structures and strategies. But now as the you know, world economy is sort of starting to, um, to improve, uh, are companies bouncing back with, it, with a renewed focus on organizational development? What I'm seeing is that um, what, what OD is starting to morph into is uh, stuff like innovation. We need to be more innovative. To be more innovative, we have to change. To change, we have to change the organization and individual's behavior. And it's, it's almost more acceptable to see something coming in as part of a way of making the organization better rather than something that is about developing the organization. So I, I've noticed that the, the emphasis on those two words, OD, uh, seem to be pushed down and a much bigger emphasis on change around innovation, uh, customer sensitivity, um, 
better logistics, operational excellence, um, encouraging faster and more agile leaders to take a bigger role in helping change the organization, that kind of thing. So we're, we're no, no way are we moving away from the need to change. If I, if that's accelerating. I just think we're slightly changing our vocabulary and creating a focus where we can create a, a, a real uh, dominant coalition, if you like, of staff. Staff coming behind the organization saying, yes, we want to survive, we want to get better, we want to be more successful, rather than something isolated called OD. You know, as a kind of almost a, a model, a theoretical model, it's now about getting skin in the game and getting, if you like, human beings warm, active, passionate about getting the organization more, or making the organization more effective. So it is definitely changing organization, but perhaps not using that banner in quite the same way as we used to. All right, well, thanks, Nigel. That was Nigel Payne, a thought leader in the fields of leadership, learning, and technology. For more videos from CLN, you can visit corporatelearningnetwork.com. Thanks for watching.